we come to the pedagogies, and these are the pedagogies that I believe we need to start to implement and play with. I'm going to give you an example of each one. The first is we need to change from a pedagogy of consumption to a pedagogy of creation. Consumption is what we're doing now. Sit and go, talk at me and I go, that's consumption. Digital technology gives us so many unbelievable opportunities to have a pedagogy of creation. You give the kids in your class a phone or a camera or a whatever and you say, go make a video. We'll talk about some of these at our session next week. You, you, you give them a piece of technology and say, build this. You will never learn more than when you start to build something. And there's always that sense of pride when you step back and you go, man, I made that. Here's an example. This is consumption. Nucleophiles, whatever those are. They, they sound like some sort of fruit. You're teaching your pupils about nuclear files, so consumption, nuclear file means blah, blah, and you give them this whole story. That's consumption. Here's an example of creation. She's got a bending ring, she needs to alkylate. I push those arrows, draw some bonds in my transition state. Cause I'm wondrous when I synthesize. I use a strong base, open epoxides. Do I hate water? No, but I love to watch it leave. I quench that charge with a bond, maybe two or three. And I hear people say, Man, I love your scheme. A mechanism theme. I synthesize with ease. Okay, it goes on and on. So these kids created this entire video on chemicals and how they bond. I can guarantee they had lots of fun and they learned so much in order to create that video. So that's the difference between consumption and creation. Right, we come to the next one. Correct to correcting. Moving from things that are correct. I'm gonna teach my kids about maths or whatever. Two goes in 208, 104. That's correct. I give it to them on a worksheet and they're done. Correcting is where things, and I talked about being retrospectively sensed. That's where you take something, for example, this is using a wiki. And the kids on this particular class, some must have been young grade, they were trying to figure out the difference between scores and the Raiders 124 and the Chargers 1 by 4. Now, because it's a wiki, every little kid in that class could go in and put in an answer. And at some stage, some of them were wrong and some were right, but they were slowly corrected. Another kid would see it and go, no, no, it's not 4, it's actually 5. It wasn't correct to start with. It was correcting. And that's a difference. It's not this is right and that is it. Oh, you've got something wrong. Wrong's okay. I talked about vulnerability. It's a process of correcting, and the learning takes place in the correcting. The third pedagogy is to move from content to conversation. We've all been schooled in teaching through content. Here, yeah, we want to teach poetry. The blunt language used in the poem is clear, and the title, the voice is well. And so we have all of this content. We have a poem, and we explain it. And we give it to the, to the class. They read the textbook. They read the poem. It's content-based. What about encouraging them to have a conversation around the poem. If you look here, you can see comments that other people have made. You highlight a line and you say comment, and you can see all the other comments people have made about it. My friend Liz actually just annotated on the same line that I did. Um, the last line, uh, I tell you why I must risk everything for the raw recipe of our passion. Um, she had a similar interest in the line, how um, it comes together and the meaning of the poem really comes together at the end. So that was probably my favorite line of this poem. I okay, so that's interesting. They're using uh, Digo and they, they create a conversation around the poem. And again, there's vulnerability because they're removed from it, it's easy, but they're talking about it. And so the pedagogy of conversation. And this is the last one. Now this one's traumatic. Okay, so hide your eyes if you don't want to look at this one. This is one that's taken. In fact, I gave this session uh, last week and I didn't even have it in. I had it in lower. I've, I've, I've promoted it. I just have to do it. Okay, because I, I just couldn't face this one. And most of us as teachers, we can't face this one. So virtual gaze. From control to chaos. You're like, no way! And you, you've got this vision of your class just running, <laughs> running wild across and just going absolutely ballistic. Thing. No, okay, that's one, Craig. I'm happy with all the others. We don't do chaos, chaos we don't do. We may misunderstand chaos. Chaos is, is not the opposite of order. Okay, so we think order and chaos. Chaos is when everyone runs wild. And I'm going to show you an excellent example of this. So, uh, I love this quote from Dole. The teacher must intentionally cause enough chaos to motivate the students to reorganize. That's what we're trying to do. I want to create enough chaos, and I'll show you examples, that you will think. You see, when everything is very controlled, and I'm not talking about your class running crazy, but when the content is controlled and organized, it doesn't encourage thinking. 
But when that content appears chaotic, it's like they have to think. And I'll show you now how that happens. So this is an example, and it's a TED Talk, and I'll show you the link now, because I'm just going to watch a short piece from it as well. And he gives this example. And he's teaching maths. Now, there's one place you don't use the word chaos when you're coming to teach maths. Well, that's essentially, although you won't use the word, that's essentially what he's arguing for. He says, we are killing maths because we're doing it the wrong way. So he says, here, this is control. A 50 kilogram pole vaulter running up. He says, you give them all the facts and all they've got to do is fill it in in a formula. And that's maths. He says, that's not life. Life doesn't work like that. You don't get just the right number of facts to fit into just the right formula to work it out. You've got too many facts. You've got too few. It's messy. That's how we should be teaching it. Watch what he says. So this is Dan Mayer, uh, TEDx. Uh, that they expect simple problems. He called it an impatience with irresolution. Um, you're, you're impatient with things that don't resolve quickly. Um, you expect sitcom-sized problems that wrap up in 22 minutes, three commercial breaks, and a, and a laugh track. And I'll put it to all of you, uh, what you already know, that no problem worth solving is that simple. Um, and I'll yield the floor here for a second to Einstein, who I believe has paid his dues. He talked about the formulation of a problem being so incredibly important. And yet, uh, in my practice, in, in the US here, we just give problems to students. We, we don't involve them in the, in the formulation of the problem. So now we have the real deal. How long will it take it to fill it up? And then even better is we take a video, a video of someone filling it up. And, uh, and it's filling up slowly, agonizingly slowly. It's tedious. Students are looking at their watches, rolling their eyes, and they're all wondering at some point or another, man, how long is it going to take to fill up? <laughs> That's how you know you've baited the hook, right? <laughs> so I get kids answering the question, how long will it take? I got kids who are, who are mathematically and conversationally intimidated joining the conversation. We put, we put names on the board, attach them to guesses, um, and kids have bought in here. And then we, we follow the process I've described. And the best part here, or one of the better parts, is that we don't get our answer from the answer key in the back of the teacher's edition. We instead just watch the end of the movie. And that's terrifying, all right? Because the, the theoretical models that always work out in the answer key, the back of the teacher's edition, like, like that's great, but it's scary to talk about sources of error when the theoretical does not match up with the practical. But those conversations have been so valuable, among the most valuable. Right, so he's creating this environment, he films something, and it's a, a little chaotic, because his kids are having to try and figure out how long this tank's gonna fill in. And he showed you early on how he had st stick drawings and how the textbook did it. But he brings in this chaotic element. As he says, it's like a little scary. But the buy-in from the pupils is unbelievable, because all of a sudden, the opportunities are so huge. And so chaos, has a huge opportunity. So those are the pedagogies that I suggest we need to do. That's why the copy paste doesn't work. Because copy paste is not about creation, correcting chaos and conversation. It's a totally different par paradigm. It's a pedagogy that was based on an old style. And so if we want to be successful in the digital age, I believe we've got to change the pedagogy quite significantly. And so the result of this, this is what you're gonna end up in your classroom. Chaos, confusion, conflict, and complaints. You think, man. Okay, thank you very much. Should we be finishing now because that's about... I do not want that. Or don't we? Okay, I'm going to show you. Literally a week ago, I ran a session with my post-grad group and we had a chat room. And in the chat room, there's, there's some of it going on there. We had about, I don't know, there's like 30 students in the class. And we were having a chat room and I was essentially debating and arguing and another uh, colleague of mine with all 30 of them at the same time. So as a teacher, I was out really thinking of like going mad. Now, if you know anything about a chat room, this thing's just flying up. And I'm trying to read their comments and reply, and I'm having like seven conversations at the same time. Now, the students are in there, and they're also experiencing this just stream. So I'm not only answering them, they're trying to read everyone else, they're trying to read mine. And so what did they say? Well, we got comments like, looking at what's been doing for the past 45 months, more like survival of the fittest, and I personally can't. Speaking to me and my colleague, I think we need a five minute break. To my reply to that, guys, you can have a break, but we're carrying on. And the last one, but it was hard to keep up with the current conversation, answering questions, asked, etc. They were like, man, we just can't keep up. Was that bad? Confusion, chaos. Well, I'll show you what it looks like if you don't have any of that. Was it good that they were really batting to get their head around? Now that thing freaks your eyes out if you look at it. How many, can you see how many black dots are there? Yeah. 
Now it freaks your eyes out because the big C is concentration. There was not a student in that class who was not concentrating. 100%. They gave me that. If you want one thing out of your pupils, if they can give you concentration, man, you have won. If that requires confusion, chaos, and all of those other bad C's that we might like, you get concentration, you've won. You can take away all of those things. You can take away the complaints and the confusion and the chaos. And of course, you can get that. No complaints. I have this often in my class. No complaints, no conflict, no confusion, no chaos, just sleeping. No questions. And definitely no concentration. You see, making people uncomfortable actually brings up their level of interaction, concentration, involvement. We mustn't be afraid of it. And even when they're complaining, I know now it's working. Now they're out of their comfort zone. And amazingly, what I could take with that transcript when we were finished, near the end of it, I started asking them questions. Retrospective sense, they could answer the questions. And then we had an assignment where they had to go and go through that and answer questions again. And now they had the transcript that they could refer to. And it was amazing how much they'd learned.